Today we have with us George R. Dupra. He has worked in the animal advocacy and protection field since 1966. He came to this work by accident. When still living at home, he chanced upon an article depicting a commercial slaughter of wildlife. This first introduction to the hidden world of animal exploitation fueled a lifelong career in animal ad advocacy. George is a member of the International Association for Bear Research and Management founding director of the Animal Alliance of Canada and past member of the board of the Canadian SPCA. He studied bear behavior, ecology, vocalization, social organization and reaction to humans with Dr. Lynn Rogers in both Minnesota and Alaska. He has rescued bears that were rehabilitated and later translocated to areas in Northern Canada. He has appeared before the Royal Commission on Seals and the Sealing Industry in Canada, traveled to the ice flows of Eastern Canada, lobbied the European Parliament in Strasbourg, as well as a number of foreign governments on a variety of animal related issues and participated in discussions and debates on both radio and television. George took part in a presentation to the Senate regarding third party spending and animal protection laws. He's also lobbied delegates at the Convention for International Trade in Endangered Species of Fauna and Flora. His last official presentation entitled Ethics and Animals in the 21st Century was to the World Future Society at the University of Mexico. He continues to lend assistance where he can in the burgeoning field of animal advocacy and habitat protection. George has also written three books, Values in Conflict, Ethics, a Human Condition, and his most recent, Cognitive Biases, Man, Animals, and the Environment. And we can't wait to hear your presentation, George, and the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Susan. And uh, you have no idea how happy I am to be here today. And uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I thought that because time is short, I, and I didn't want to talk about anything that was too uh, negative. Uh, I wanted to be a little more uplifting, so I decided to talk about the evolution of the animal advocacy, how we came to be where we are today, because there have been changes. And, uh, you know, the first laws in Canada protecting animals came into being in 1892. That's a long time ago, and there really haven't been any significant changes, I say significant changes, since that time. And a lot of us have been trying to make some inroads there, trying to make some changes, recognizing the difficulties in, in doing that, recognizing how difficult that is for our politicians, and recognizing that we're dealing with different points of view. It's not an easy thing to do. So when we're the, the, the law that exists is under the Criminal Code of Canada, it goes between Articles 444 and 447. And the number one, the laws recognize animals as property, no different than your toaster. Okay, they recognize animals as property and they don't recognize all animals. They only recognize some. They recognize domestic animals and only some of those domestic animals. Uh, they do not recognize domestic animals that are used in research. And there's all manner of animals used in research, all manner of research and we think of medical research there's also military research cosmetic research so on and so forth so exotic animals the type you find in zoos and circuses and aquariums are not protected not under the criminal code of canada uh, wildlife not protected agricultural animals are not protected as it works you have uh, the federal laws uh, which is, as I said, uh, Articles 444 through 447. Uh, under the federal laws, you have regulations, and the regulations are under provincial jurisdiction. Then you have bylaws, which are under municipal jurisdiction. And then you have what we consider to be a major problem, and that is industry standards. And uh, the Canadian uh, Food Investigation Agency, uh, uh, Canadian Council on Animal Care, uh, the Fur Trade, uh, research animals, military training, uh, all fall under industrial standards uh, because it's very, very difficult to do it any other way. This gives us uh, a lot of problems. Uh, the 
enforcement of regulations with the Canadian SPCA or any SPCA across Canada. And when I say SPCAs or humane societies, I'm talking about one group here uh, in the interest of time, is very, very difficult because it's narrow. It's very hard for them to enforce. The Canadian SPCA, when I was on the board, did the entire province of Quebec. And the problem with the criminal code is you must prove intent. You must prove willful cruelty or willful negligence. Very hard to do that, particularly when you're dealing with different areas of the province. Because what we in Montreal or any other, you know, Sherbrooke or a place like that might consider to be cruel, someone in another area of the province, probably in a rural area, doesn't see it that way. They see things differently. So it's very difficult to make changes, very difficult, particularly under a legal system, to do anything. You have to sort of coerce people. You have to try and, and, and get them to, to buy into your program. So we have some difficulties there with the application of what limited laws exist, what, you know, where it's a very narrow concept. Now for the SBCAs to work under the Canadian, right now, what we have is our Canadian laws. It's also narrow because the SPCAs are very, very susceptible to regional interests. This is why you never hear the Calgary SPCA talking about the Calgary Stampede and the death of horses during the chuck wagon race. We've lost 70 horses since 1976 during the chuck wagon races. And those are the ones that die on the track. We don't hear about the ones that limp off or are dragged off and die somewhere else. So the same thing applies for barrel racing and what have you. It's, the SPCA can't do anything because they are very, very susceptible to the regional, uh, the regional interest. Same thing goes for the Newfoundland SPCA. They never talk about the seal hunt. They can't. They can't do it. So they have their problems. The problems, the law, and the problem is they're susceptible to regional uh, regional interests. Uh, we tried years ago, I think it was uh, in the 60s, early 60s, to redesignate animals. Animals, it, it works this way. You have human rights and you have property rights. Property rights means you can own a car, you can own a house, you can own a toaster. Unfortunately, it also means you can own a pig, you can own cattle, you can own horses, you can own whatever you want. We thought it would be easier if we had human rights, property rights, and living property rights. We thought people might buy that because it was all, there's always, you know, the, the, the animal industries are always fighting us whenever we try and make progress. We just can't move ahead. And the difference is because of all the, the regulations and because of the, the restraints that the SPCAs are under, the best they can afford, the best they, can, they, they have done, at least when I was on the board, was to business as usual, maintain the norm. They never could move the agenda forward. We wanted to move the agenda forward. So we thought that if we had living property, we would be able to move the agenda forward while not really hurting industry, not hurting the animal industries. If you own a toaster and it burns the toast and you want to beat it up with a, with a hammer, that's your business. If you own a horse and the horse doesn't win the race, doesn't run fast enough, and you decide to neglect it, you don't want to feed it, you don't, it's bothering you, and you're not very, very not, it's still property. It's still property. Whereas if we would have living property, you could still own the horse, you could still run the horse and jump over the fences and all that sort of thing. But if the horse doesn't jump over the fence, that doesn't give you the right to abuse it or neglect it. So you would have human rights, property rights, living property rights. Well, that we thought we could get through. That was shot down like a lead balloon. The industry didn't like it. They were concerned that it might be the thin edge of the wedge. Well, of course, it was the thin edge of the wedge. It was the thin edge of the wedge because taking your next breath is the thin edge of the wedge. So off we went. And we were under a lot of criticism. The Ontario Humane Society, those of you from Kingston would be aware of this, used to do all the uh, abuse and cruelty investigations in Ontario. And they were under the same restrictions as everyone else was. And no one was very, very satisfied with what they were doing. They were under tremendous criticism from everybody. PETA's doing this, PETA's doing that, you guys aren't doing anything, you don't go to court, you don't do this, you don't do that. Well, of course, PETA's a totally different organization, totally different mandate, not the same thing at all. Finally, the OHS, I think it was last year, said, that's it. 
We're not doing inspections anymore. We're getting out of the business. We quit. And they walked out. Nobody's doing it now except the Ontario Provincial Police. And the Ontario Provincial Police have their priorities. Animals aren't one of them. And they're really not trained in that field. The Ontario Humane Society, though not perfect, their primary uh, mandate, their first mandate, and this applies for all SPCAs, education and shelter. You go back to the RSPCA and all the wonderful work they did. Primarily, it was education and shelter. They got the inspection part just unloaded on them because nobody else wanted to do it. Unfortunately, we never gave them the tools to do it, the tools meaning the laws. So they were under a lot of criticism. In 19, I was on the board of the Canadian SPCA, uh, I guess in the late 80s, uh, but I got started in 1966. And it started around the dining room table at my parents' house and uh, in Saint Laurent, and we decided to start a small little group to fight this ongoing commercial hunt. And it grew and grew and grew. And we, because back then, back in those days, there was no such thing as animal rights didn't exist. And the only times you read about animal issues were maybe once a year during Christmas, they could, they'd have a feel good story. Or maybe you read the George Greenfield column, if you happen to be a hunter. That's about it. You never heard about anything else. So we took these pictures that we got, that we went out to, to get, and we had them published. And it, uh, it, it, today we say it went viral. It didn't go viral back then because we didn't have computers, but it went to the United States, it went to Western Europe, went to England, went to Australia. We even got letters, cards from Vietnam, and this was during the war in Vietnam. The organization grew so big that we founded a group in 1969 called the International Fund for Animal Welfare. And it was big, humongous. It rivaled Cleveland Amory's Fund for Animals. These are the only two major organizations that existed. Uh, these were primarily animal advocacy organizations. We actually funded the very first Greenpeace expedition, Patrick Moore, when he went up to Antarctica. Uh, but that was an environmental organization. It's not the same thing. Sometimes people try and compare, and you can't do that. And the organization group. We recognized that as long as we were playing under a different set of rules, the rules set up by the government, by industry, we were never going to move the agenda forward. The best we could do was maintain, maintain the standards that were already there. And they, were, they didn't meet our expectations. To fight a professional, you have to pay another professional to do it. This whole business of if you're with the SPCA, you shouldn't be wearing a hair shirt. Otherwise, you're not sincere. And if you make any money, you're a con artist. That's kind of silly. I could never accept that. I couldn't understand why it was all right to make millions, billions, trillions of dollars exploiting animals, but somehow immoral to make any money defending them. Didn't understand that at all. So we decided to fight a professional. We had to hire professionals because we had one guy who would go up against ornithologists and go up against ichthyologists and go up against equine vets and all the rest of it in debates. And he really couldn't be all things to all animals. We got floored every time. And it, we realized this was by design. So we brought in money. We were able to hire professionals. The Alliance has a number of consultants that are highly professional in our field. And we're now, along with many others, uh, trying to make some changes. Here in Quebec, animals are just now being given the designation of sentient beings, which is a major, major step forward. Uh, we've got a long way to go, but it is a major step forward. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot to do. As I mentioned, uh, we have these, these four categories, domestic, agricultural, exotic, and farm animals. And we talk about the laws, but the problem is we cannot presently operate with the laws that we have. Now, we have gone from welfare to something called animal rights. What's that all about? What's that mean, animal rights? People say animals can't have rights because they don't understand the concept. Pigs can't have values. What, what do you mean applying a human value to a pig? This, makes no sense. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. You can't do that. 
can't we? What people don't understand about animal rights, well, I have to admit, this is my definition, is that animal rights has nothing to do with pigs, horses, cows, and chickens. It has everything to do with us. It has to do with me. It has to do with how I feel, what my ethics are, what my values are. If you go down the 401, just beyond Kingston, there's a place called Mill Haven. And in Mill Haven, there are some noted Canadians, one Paul Bernardo, some of you might remember him. He and his wife took pleasure in tormenting and murdering two young women. They denied these two young women their basic rights to life. Not too far from him is one Louis uh, Magnatus, is that it? Lucas McNattis, who killed a Chinese student at McGill University. He denied that student his rights to life. And out west, not to leave the westerners, that we have one Picton, William Willie Picton, also known as the pig farmer, who we know has killed 64 women and is suspect, he says, he's killed more than 92. Obviously, he denied them the rights. Therefore, these men do not fully understand the concept of rights. What do we do as a civilized society? We extend them the very rights they deny their victims. The right to the presumption of innocence, the right to legal advice, legal representation, the right to a trial, the right to an appeal should they lose, the right to uh, medical care, psychological care, spiritual uh, consultation, although I doubt that they'd go for that, all kinds of rights that they deny the victims. Why do we do that? Why are we doing that? Because we love our fellow man? No, I don't think so. We do that after we, we do our state of shock and anger. We do that because of who we strive to be. We strive to be better than who we really are. We all have our ethical cruising altitude. Our values are there. We strive to be better than who we are. I like to treat a pig or a horse in the same manner that I would like to be treated by any other living being. It makes me who I am. When someone says to me, you shouldn't do this. Why are you getting all bent out of shape? You shouldn't be doing this. What they're telling me is that I shouldn't be who I can be, who I strive to be. To me, it's, it's a... Well, it's, it's not really offensive, but it, it's suggesting that we should settle and that I should settle and I shouldn't try and get above that cruising altitude. So animal rights, though I don't like the title, I prefer natural entitlements. If you read some animal rights uh, articles, some people call them manifestos, and simply replace animal rights with the term natural entitlement, all of a sudden, it falls into place. Do eagles, falcons, uh, uh, and, and, and other birds have the right to fly freely, untethered in the heavens? Most people would say yes. Do dolphins, porpoises, whales have the right to swim in unpolluted oceans? Most people would say yes. If you use the word rights, then you get into an argument. But it's a question of natural entitlements. That's what animal rights means to me. It doesn't mean violence. It doesn't mean vandalism, which is not terrorism, by the way. It doesn't mean that at all. It just means it's a step in moving the agenda forward. So understand that uh, I'm frequently asked, which is the best organization for me? Which organization should I belong to? And that all depends on you. It depends on your motives. It depends on what you want to do, what you're striving to do. There's some great organizations out there. If you're a hunter, I don't agree with it, but who made me God? I'm not God. World Wildlife Fund is a great outfit. It's hunter-based. Ducks Unlimited, hunter-based. These are organizations who see things differently. Fine, do that. If you're an environmental organization, well, there's a lot of good, uh, um, the Green Coalition right here in Quebec is fighting for, at the Techno Park where they're as well, although they're taking the lead. Uh, these are great organizations. It depends on what you're looking for. The difference between, there are differences, the difference between the World Wildlife Fund, I'm trying not to take up too much time here, the World Wildlife Fund, which is a good organization, uh, came into being in 1965, 1967, something like that. 
uh, uh, is a good organization, but very different from the Animal Alliance of Canada. And I asked myself, why is it that most conservative people, the people of a conservative mindset, prefer being members of the World Wildlife Fund rather than the Animal Alliance of Canada or a somewhat similar organization? And the answer to that, I think, is that the, the World Wildlife Fund really doesn't ask you to do anything. You send them money, they send you a tax receipt, something that the Animal Alliance up to now isn't doing. It may be doing that shortly, but it's not doing it at the moment. You send them more money and they send you a nice little decal. You can put a panda bear that you can stick on your office wall. Looks good. If you send them even more money, they send you a plaque. Oh, pretty good. And you know what? You really don't have to do that much. Everybody likes the World Wildlife Fund. Why? Because they don't offend anybody. They don't challenge anybody. They don't move the agenda forward. They don't. You see, these animal rights groups, there's a problem with them. There's a big problem with them. They want you to, they want you to change. They want you to become a vegan. What's that, a vegan? That's ridiculous. They want you to stop wearing animal skins. What, are they crazy? They want you to, they want you, when you buy something, they want you to look for that little rabbit, that, that leaping rabbit, not the sitting rabbit, not the lying rabbit, not the sleeping rabbit, but the leaping rabbit. That doesn't make any sense. You're going to be in there all day. It's going to take you a week to shop if you have to do all that. They want you to say, they want you to use public transportation. Oh my God, they're crazy. I firmly believe that a lot of people don't even listen to what some animal rights groups have to say because it challenges everything we are. And of course, we're not asking people, I'm speaking of the Animal Alliance now, we're not asking people to do everything. What we ask people to do is make one significant change in their life, one, just one. And not only benefit animals, it'll benefit people. It will benefit people. Um, I don't know where I'm running on time because I know in question, it's only 15 minutes or something like that. I don't, okay. Uh, let me know when I'm running out of time. It's, a, it's not a question of being overly critical for the Animal Alliance, uh, for the, the World Wildlife Fund. They do good work. Make no mistake about it. They do good work. They also run interference, <coughs> which is one of the reasons I'm bringing them up. Polar bears, climate change. We all know we have a major problem with climate change. We're very much involved in trying to do something about that. We wanted to protect the polar bear and we wanted the polar bear put on uh, one of the appendices to protect the polar bear because of the situation. 19 populations of polar bears and uh, there's only one or two that are doing reasonably well, and that could be because of biodiversity. We don't know yet. But nonetheless, they're in a bad way. You've all seen these pictures of emaciated polar bears pulling themselves out of the, uh, the ocean onto uh, out of the Hudson's Bay, onto ice floes. The ring seal herds collapsed. They're in a bad way. And we wanted to protect the polar bear. And we were stopped. The people who stopped us was the World Wildlife Fund. Their argument was that hunting had nothing to do with the situation of polar bears in. And of course, they're absolutely correct. It's climate change. But we asked ourselves, what can we do about climate change in the short term or the midterm? Not very much. You can't stop the natives from hunting polar bears. They've been doing it for years. Can't stop that. Wouldn't even try. Okay, what can we do? What can we do? We can't change the climate overnight. And the polar bear is in a very precarious situation. What can we do? And it occurred to us, the only thing we could do is stop trophy hunting. Trophy hunters go after the young, the strong, the biggest, the most virile, the most genetically apt to be able to protect the integrity of the species. Trophy hunter isn't going to go after that emaciated bear that's crawling out on, under the ice. They're going to go after the big and the strong. So if we could protect the big and the strong, we had a better chance of protecting the polar bear while we dealt with the long-term problems of climate change. 
for a while, I thought said no. But then again, they're hunter based. I'm not passing judgment on them. I say they do great work in certain areas. In other areas, we all do that. We all make mistakes. We all do things that we think are great, and it turns out to be less than great. But there are differences in the organizations. You try and appreciate what the organization does, not so much what they don't do. And you have to try and understand how that works. World Wildlife Fund was founded by Prince Philip. Did a lot of good. That mindset, the mindset that we had in the 50s, still exists today, running the World Wildlife Fund. That mindset is the same mindset that runs CITES, the Convention for International Trade in Endangered Species, the Foreign Fund. That mindset runs the Ministry of Natural Resources in Western Europe, North America. It's a mindset of protect in order to exploit. There's a problem with that. The problem comes, and, and it's, it's written out in the uh, Living Planet Report of the World Wildlife Fund, not mine, that says that in the past 50 years, we've lost 60% of our known wildlife. CITES came into being in 1975, do the math. CITES has been pretty much running the management of species uh, of both uh, of wildlife species and uh, flora for the past 50 years. We've lost 60% of our known wildlife. People tell us we're not being pragmatic. But if we look at the numbers and what we've lost and what we project to lose within the next 50 years, we have to come to the conclusion that what we're doing something wrong here. We're doing something wrong. We have to conduct postmortems. For those of you who are in business, you know as well as I do that if you lose 60% of your market share, you're gone. And it doesn't take 50 years to get you out. It usually takes three years for people to realize that whatever your business plan is, it's not working. But we keep doing the same that we repackage and repackage and repackage. One thing we do is we put values on things. Big mistake. Big mistake. We shouldn't be doing that. The listings, the index of CITES should be reversed. We tried to do that in the second meeting of the parties, we got defeated. That is, instead of having to prove that a species is in imminent danger of falling into the abyss, and then having to carry it out of three quarters or 75% of the voting members, 185 parties, we simply reversed the whole thing, put everything on the protected list. And if you wanted to exploit whatever it was, you would have to prove that it can withstand exploitation and carry either three quarters or 75% of the voting parties. Well, that went over like a lead balloon. It didn't work at all. It was reaction rather than proaction. It was working the palliative care unit rather than working the other end of the school when you're trying to keep your kids from smoking rather than waiting for them to come down with, 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 with cancer or something along those lines. We tried to be proactive. There's no simple solution to this because there are reasons societies exist the way it exists. There's so many ways around the appendices. There's three appendices. There's so many ways around that, you know, taking out a reservation within the first 30 days, you're no longer accountable. You no longer have to follow the rules. Or if you're a first time member or you simply step out of the voting, there's so many, there's vote trading. Believe me, I've been there. I know what it's like. What we're doing just isn't working. It's not working. We have to make changes. Organizations are all different. Nobody has a monopoly on what is the right thing to do. It's a, it's a bit of everything. It's a bit of everything. So um, I do want to open this up to questions because I know some of you are probably wondering about polar Some of you are probably wondering about CITES uh, and my field and values. Values is very important. Old growth forests. You know, we're trying to protect the old growth forest. The premier in British Columbia, we're at odds with right now. Worst year in, in BC history for forest fires and for floods and then this and that and all the rest. But what are we doing? We're cutting down old growth forests. We're not in favor of that at all. If you want to ask about greenhouse gas effects and old growth forests, you ask me about it, and we'll do this in questions and answers. That way, I won't be so pressed for time. So, if you want to go to questions and answers, I'm ready. I'll try.
I'll go first. I go, okay. Uh, George, uh, you, you, earlier in, in your presentation, you were talking about uh, the law and uh, yeah, getting, uh, getting proof and uh, so on and so forth. When, when, you, when these hidden cameras go in, you know, they kind of infiltrate a chicken farm or whatever, and they go in with these hidden cameras and they, and they come out with the proof. Uh, we always see it on, on television, like, oh, you know, we caught these people doing this. What, what ultimately happens? So if, if, if I don't misunderstand, uh, it's nothing. Absolutely. Uh, some of you might remember uh, years ago at Western Ontario University, Western Ontario, yeah. we had a break in at the lab there. Uh, for, there was a monkey of B53. And uh, Vicki Miller, who was then the head of the uh, Toronto Humanities, was behind it. And uh, they were told they had received um, anonymous information that there was a monkey strapped to a restrainer chair being used in cardiovascular tests. And the dean of the department said, no, it is not happening. It does not happen here. It's not happening, period. Thank you. It is not happening. The Canadian Council on Animal Care, which is a peer review medical research uh, group, over, oversight group, uh, said, it's not happening. It's against our rules. You don't know what you're talking about. It's not happening. There's no monkey in any restrainer chair, nothing. Okay. They kept receiving more messages, more uh, from students inside saying, yes, it is happening. Well, they broke in and the rest is history. They took pictures. There was the monkey strapped into the restrainer chair. And unfortunately, they also created a lot of damage. Well, the fourth estate came after the, the, well, we now know it was Vicki Miller. Uh, we knew it at, <laughs> right after it happened because I recognized her voice. She was being interviewed with a brown paper bag over her head. And they went after them to the nail because they broke in and they created a lot of damage, which is true. They shouldn't have created a lot of damage. They shouldn't have had to break in. What we never heard of was what happened to the dean of the department. Was he misinformed? Did he not know what was going on in his own research facility? What about the Canadian Council on Animal Care? What did they do? Didn't hear anything about that. Well, I'll tell you something. To my knowledge, no charges were ever pressed. There was a lot of ink, a lot of media coverage about those terrible animal rights people. They had no right to do this. There was a lot of that. Throw the book at them, the whole thing. But they never pressed charges. Why do you think that happened? Why do you think no cha charges were pressed? because they didn't want to have to answer some rather awkward questions. Even if you win a case in court uh, for cruelty to animals, they're considered property. Your dog means more to you than your toaster, okay? He's part of your family. So you have not so much a value, not an economic value, you have a, 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 an intrinsic value. He's part of your family. The court looks at the dog and says, how much is it worth? What's the value of this dog? What's the value of this horse that was left out in the field and hadn't been fed in three weeks or whatever in the middle of the winter? What's the value? And then you get the meat value. What you will get is property value. If you win, but you must prove intent. And that is extremely difficult to do. What happens? Not very much. We wanted, uh, there was a case in, in, in New Brunswick, if I might, uh, where um, a man dragged a horse, along with his two sons, dragged a horse behind a pickup truck at high speed. Dragged the horse, dragged the horse, dragged the horse. And the horse had been so badly battered that uh, he had to be euthanized uh, and because he had driven this, this uh, pulled this horse at high speed. So it went to court. It went to court. And we were asked by our lawyers, they said, well, what do you want to do? What are you going to do? What's, what's the story here? What are you going to do? And, he, and we said, look, we're not interested in a jail sentence. That doesn't do any good. Work. This man had a long record. He was well known for all kinds of things. He had a, an anger management problem, a drinking problem. And we said, we're not interested in that because if he loses, if he goes to jail and loses his job and he'll blame it on his wife, his kids, everybody else, he has an anger management problem. That's not what we want. 
What we want is this man to, for the judge to be able to say to this man, you are prohibited from owning an animal, from owning, possessing, living with, or living with someone who has an animal for the rest of your life. No animals. Finito. That would be the worst case scenario. The man still walks out of court. He still has his job. What's left of his self-respect, his dignity. Maybe he's been sentenced also to see Alcoholics Anonymous or something like that. I don't know. What we wanted was that he be prohibited from ever owning an animal again. Couldn't do that because the law did not allow the judge that latitude. He could operate within a small uh, sentence or, or the, a really severe sentence, which was a fine. Things are slowly changing now, especially, uh, I can't speak for other provinces in Quebec where we have this new designation called sentient beings. Hopefully that will change things and we will be able to give judges more latitude. It's not vindictiveness that we're looking for. We're not looking for send a guy to jail. We're not saying that because that does more harm than good. But to protect the animal, and that's what we're here for, the judge should be allowed to forbid ownership, either for a period of time or for life. That's what we would like to see. I hope that answers your questions. The best Thank you. Thank you, George. Um, Jim, is that, does that answer the question, Jim? Thank you very much. No, that's fine. Okay. Deborah, you have a question? Yes, I do. Um, this past week, I read an article that the SPCA in BC uh, went into a, a farm and uh, confiscated 216 cattle. And they said it was the worst uh, maltreatment of these animals that they had ever seen. They were malnourished, they were filthy, etc. And uh, you had mentioned, I, I believe, I, if I heard correctly, you mentioned that the SBCA didn't, doesn't have um, the ability to go in and um, take over uh, a cattle farm. Um, and so I, I just wanted your comments on that. Because this yeah. happened just this past week. Okay. It's, not, it's, it's not that they don't have the ability. If they have, they have to, the SBC just can't, they, they can go on your property, knock, uh, knock on the door and, and give you the lay of the land, say, look, we've had a complaint about this, that, and the other. That they can do. But they cannot go on your property and seize cattle. They can't do that. They have to get a warrant and a court order from a judge, go to the police, and with the police, they will go on the property and the police will, will follow up on the court order. And then you can seize the cattle. Uh, the problem, pending court appearance, of course, the problem, you know, a lot of problems with that is it's very costly to seize the cattle because you have to feed them, you have to vet them, you have to house them, you have to have people who help you out. That's why we're part of an alliance uh, because we do have some people who can help us out. Uh, and there's no guarantee you're gonna win the case. There's absolutely no guarantee you're gonna win the case. It depends on where you are uh, and it depends, um, uh, I can cite examples of, of, of what happened with horses down in Sherbrooke. But, uh, you know, no, the SPCA can't just come and take animals away. Okay, I think, I think they were with the fire department and the police and there were, they said it was the worst abuse or the article stated that it was the worst abuse they had ever seen. Yeah. And for 1600 cattle uh, mm -hmm. that were filthy, malnourished, hadn't been fed, uh, they were ill. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they went in. So I guess they had the legal backing to do this um. what happens is that we ordinarily not necessarily us although we do in certain parts, uh, what happens is when the cattle are seized there's a place they, we, we, they're, they're, where they're brought and again when you go to court what happens is the judge has to decide the, the lawyers will probably argue diminished capacity on, 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 on uh, for the, the owners or some other problem some maybe they just disappeared. They couldn't pay their bills, so they packed up and they disappeared and they left it there. Then the, the, the judge has to decide what happens to the cattle. And it's they're usually sent over to uh, an organization such as the Animal Alliance or some other organization, whomever that might be, where the vets are brought in and the vets will make it, this one can be saved, that one can't be, this one will be let her off dead, this one's suffering, so on and so forth. That's what happens to them. Uh, then you're, I hate to say this, but we're stuck with them. 
we're stuck with them. We, we've been stuck with cattle. We've been stuck with 12 of them or something like that. I don't remember the numbers. And fortunately, they're, they're being housed and being fed. We're paying for it. Uh, and and uh, it's, you're kind of stuck with them. You don't know what to do with them. It's, it's not an easy, it's, you know, let somebody else handle a problem. Let somebody else, have, that's why the Ontario Humane finally decided to throw in the towel and say, you do it. If you don't like the way we're doing things, do it yourself. If you think you can do, do a better job. It's not an easy thing to do. No, and this, this was 216 cattle. This is yeah, I, I wish I could tell you that that is an isolated case, but it's not an isolated yeah. case. There's a lot of cases of, of that. Uh, mm -hmm. that's going on. We're going through a pandemic right now, as you know, COVID-19. And a few years ago, we went through SARS. And of course, we've had all these uh, H1N1 and all that sort of thing. Um, and we suspect, we have every reason to believe that these are uh, animal-based. These, 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 these the problems are animal-based. We've talked about wet markets in Huang, China, and so on and so forth. And, and you know, we have a facility in Los Angeles, a factory farm, an intensive farm that has, you ready for this? 90,000 pigs, 90,000. And we stopped, apparently stopped using antibiotics, even though people who invest in this want to be able to protect their investment. We stopped using antibiotics because it was not good for people. You ended up eating this stuff. So if they're not using antibiotics, they've got to be using something else, something that is extremely similar to that. We had 90,000, just not too far from Toronto, we've got another massive, massive intensive unit. Well, I think it's chickens and something like nine or 10 floors high. And you see, we'll work on the proactive side. We try and we, we have nothing against farms, but we have this problem with this intensive stuff. It's sort of like sizes. It's like you can work one side or the other. We work the proactive side to try and, and minimize the possibility of problems. Minimize that process, possibly. We've done all kinds of things go way back and when I look, think about it. Uh, some of it sounded pretty silly back then, but today sound a little more, um, a little more realistic. Um, it, it's a problem. It's a problem. A lot of people run into financial difficulty. A lot of farmers run into financial difficulty and handle it over their heads and they just walk out. They just throw up their arms and walk out. And it's an unfortunate situation. I'm sorry, Ken, I don't have a better answer than that. Thank you. Thank you, George. Um, Ron, you have a question? Yes, I do. Um, you were talking about polar bears. Um, my my daughter did her master. She was in church in Manitoba. I think she spoke to the Rotary Club of Westmount about the subject. And apparently there's a big to do about it because there's so much tourism in Manito in Churchill and the polar bears are diminishing. What is your take on it? Should they curb tourism there or what should they do and let the polar bears survive? At the moment, this is the first time that I've heard people say that the, the polar bears are diminishing. The complaint that we got was that there were more from, from the community was that they, uh, there were more polar bears in Churchill than ever before, which justified the hunting. And our argument was it wasn't that there were more polar bears, it's that it was a question of compression. Obviously, the further a polar bear has to go out into the, into, uh, the Arctic, in order to uh, catch a ring seal, for example, which is their favorite prey, uh, you don't have to be a mathematical genius to know that if you're spending one point of energy, uh, uh, that is two points of energy in order to recoup one point of energy, you're losing, you're losing ground. So what the polar bears do, they're not stupid, is they will go to the closest available food source, which is usually the garbage dumps and waste disposal areas in smaller communities. So, when people told us, well, there's more polar bears walking down, we used to see one polar bear walking down the street, maybe two. Now we're seeing four and five walk down the street. We would say, yes, that's compression because there's no seals. There's no, there's nothing for them to eat. They can go after walrus, but walrus, as you know, they're fighters, you know, and, and it's, polar bears aren't stupid. I go after a walrus, I might win the fight, but I'm going to come out injured. If I go after a ring seal, I'm all set. I'm ready to go. So, we were, heard, uh, were told that the reverse was happening, that there, there were fewer polar bears, uh, no more polar bears coming into Churchill. And that was their justification for allowing hunting. Now, uh, the tourism, tourism can be a problem. We see that up in uh, the Galapagos. 
too many tourists up there leaving the pollution behind. Uh, we see it in the Serengeti in, in, in Africa. Uh, there are more tire treads in the Serengeti than there are wildlife, you know, from the Jeeps and, the, and all that sort of stuff. It can be a problem. It's the first I've heard that it, it is a problem in Churchill. Could be, I don't know. It could be. Yeah. We have a lot of work to do there. Thank you. Thank you, George. I have a question. Yes. I have a question. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Go ahead. Let's say a couple in Quebec are going through a divorce, a rather acrimonious, but they have a dog and they can't decide who should have custody of the dog. Does the court ever appoint an advocate? I use the word advocate in a very large sense of the word lawyer or expert to represent the rights of the dog. Where would this be suited? No, no. What, what the courts might, what I, I know they do, is they tell the people, hey, work this out between yourselves. You both have lawyers, work it out. I don't think they go so, I know, I've never heard of them representing an advocate to represent the interests of the dog. I've never heard that. No, no, no. Okay, David, does that answer your question? Well, uh, I just retired from law. It's not an area that I would uh, advocate. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Then I have the pleasure of thanking you, George, for this very stimulating, extremely interesting uh, presentation. Um, you articulate and committed and dedicated, and we thank you. And I know I'm paraphrasing when I say that um, a society is known by the way that they treat their animals, and you really brought that home to us. So thank you very, very much for taking the time to present. Thank you. Thanks. Have, have a great day. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Heather?